Hello, my name is Bob Tribe and welcome to Valley to Vietnam. Valley to Vietnam is a joint effort between the Sacramento Public Library and the Vietnam Vets of America, Chapter 500. It is our intent to trace the arc of experience between Sacramento and Vietnam for our local Vietnam era vets. Today, our guest is Mike Simmons, who served uh, as a door gunner with the 4th Infantry Division. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Yeah, my father, after World War II, he was, uh, he was at where you were, at Fort Benning, Georgia. My dad was there. My dad was also served up in, uh, in Alaska during the early parts of the Japanese coming across there. Uh -huh. And uh, so when he got home, he just didn't want to stay in one spot. He just wanted to go see America. Yeah. So we did. So initially, you're in North Sacramento, which is yes. part of Sacramento now, but yes, uh, it is, was separate uh, then. Um, and where'd you go to school there? Uh, I first started in uh, Noralto, Noralto Elementary School, and then I went to Las Palmas Junior High, and, and then uh, we moved out into the uh, East area, and I ended up at Jonas Salk for eighth grade, and then uh, I went to a, uh, Encina High School. And what sort of places, now that you, you became a teenager, what, where did you hang out? Well, the local haunts for us, obviously. Sam's was a big spot for us all to drop S into. We Sam's had Hoff Bra that still exists. <laughs> that still yeah. exists, and I still go there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do too. <laughs> uh, Harvey's was always a place that we went. That We had, uh, God, what was that, Carnation? You remember oh. Carnation over on uh, Marconi? And then Tasty Freeze, and uh, so Tasty Freeze was across from from Sam's, right? On on White Avenue, and Harvey's was on Fulton, right? And they're both gone now. Both gone. Yeah. That's true. And Carnation is gone. Carnation is gone. Yeah. Um, how about Bowling Alley? Oh gosh, yeah. We'd go yeah. there and shoot pool. Yes. Country Club Lanes. Yes. Right close to Sam's. Uh, used to uh, hang out at the river a lot. Was uh, loved to fish, loved to play in the river, and yeah. and it was real close to where we lived. And so we uh, would always make journeys. Even when when I was in North Sacramento, we did a lot of journeys down there. We did a little fishing, cruising, uh, K, J, and L streets, and yes. hanging out at Mel's Drive-In. Mel's Drive-In. Yes, we had a lot of fun downtown. Nineteenth and J. <laughs> also long gone. So you graduated from uh, Encina High School in. 1964? 1964, yes. Okay. In, uh, in 1965, I got the notice. Ah. Greetings from the president, right? Okay. <laughs> so I decided that I was going no matter what, so we just went down and I went down and volunteered for the draft. Ah. And so they took me in the next draft in December. Okay, December of 65. All right. And you went to basic training where? I went to basic training uh, in Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh -huh. uh, we actually were spent two weeks in Fort Ord, but then they took us up to Washington. My alphabet got to draw for North. Right. And uh, I spent uh, basic training there, and then afterwards uh, came home for a couple of weeks, went to uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia. And oh. that's where they sent me to aviation school for hydraulics, okay. know, hydraulic repairmen. So you were doing, learning hydraulic, maintenance repair, all that sort of thing mm -hmm. with helicopters. Yep, helicopters and, fi and ro uh, fixed wing as oh, well. Okay. So systems yeah. are all the same. And then it was back to Fort Lewis and we trained until the 1st of August and I left for Vietnam. And did they fly you? Did you go by boat? What did no, you do? I went by boat. We took our helicopters over, being in a helicopter outfit, they had, uh, uh, the World War II, they called them sub-chasers, and they're like mini aircraft carriers. Oh. And we loaded, I think we had 44 helicopters that we originally took over, and we loaded them all on, and then 19 days in sea, and uh, two days of real fun with the typhoon in the Luzon Straits. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that was a, it was a bumpy ride. We had some 30, 35 foot waves out there. We never got off of the ship while we were there. We stayed on the ship and just flew everything off. But I do remember watching the uh, firefights uh, from the helicopters in the evening. It was the light show. Yeah. And, and you said, oh boy, we're here. <laughs> so from Cameron Bay, once you landed, where did you go? They took us north to the mechanics. They took us north to Quignon. Okay. And from there we got off of the ship and, and, uh, and that's where in the notes I said that I met General Westmoreland. 
uh, I ran right into a PX. I thought I was in a combat zone, and I ended up in a PX. So, but when uh, General Westmoreland was there, and he said, "Welcome to the country," and I said, "Thank you," and I toddled off on my journey. <laughs> wow, the overall commander of everything in <laughs> Vietnam, and you—that's the first person you meet. So you're in Quinh Yon, and what what were you doing then? Well, they, the first day they took us out to what they call the truck and trailer points that was just outside of the uh, outside of the city itself, and that was where they, the equipment that was coming over for the 4th Infantry Division and the trucks and trailers and everything that they needed was actually put out there, and uh, when you were a new troop coming in, it was your job was to take some up to where we were going. Next stop was Pleiku, it was about 95 miles away from uh, from Quignon. And unlike, you know, later in the war, most people came over as replacements to a division, a unit, whatever. You guys were actually establ getting established there because you came over with the, the bulk of the 4th Infantry, right? Uh, I was an advance party that took the helicopters so, over. So and you were ahead of them? Yeah, we were about 30 days ahead of the, uh, maybe three weeks ahead of the uh, really large numbers of troops. Okay. And that's why I ended up on the detail of driving uh, 100 miles a day through <laughs> up that Highway 19 to play coup. How safe was that highway? It wasn't very safe at all. And you told me, I said, well, what kind of protection do you have? I mean, did you have troops on the truck? And you said, yeah, well, I had a, a relief driver <laughs> and a lot of sandbags on the floor. And we each had what, an M14 at that time? An M14 at that time, yeah, that was what we had for... So uh, you got two M14s to protect yourself from anything that may hit you. Yep, and we climbed the mountains, I'll never forget it, eight miles an hour. Oh my God. That was as fast as I could go. <laughs> Sitting duck, well, what, what, was, what were, was in the trucks? Uh, it basically, it was all of our equipment. Some of it was aviation, some of it was uh, uh, the motor pool stuff for all of the division, uh, uh -huh. different division companies and stuff. There was headquarters stuff in there, that just about everything you could dream up that okay. 18,000 guys would need uh, for a year. Is anybody flying over those trucks and giving you kind of air cover or anything while you're moving them? We had, uh, I'll be, uh, no, we didn't have, the only time we had helicopters is, is usually when, is after something happened, uh -huh. then we would get support that way. But we had artillery the whole way up. You said, uh, boy, as soon as we get these helicopters together, we're going to have some protection. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know that at the time, <laughs> yeah. but yes, that Ugh. turned out to be a good thing. That's a little scary. So did, yeah. did the, any of the convoys get ambushed or? We had a number of convoys that got ambushed. They would do different uh, different positions. They'd pick you out in, in the center. They'd pick you up at front to jam everything up. They they were pretty clever at that, and they had a they had a distinct way of blowing up the bridges that were down in the lower lands, and uh -huh. uh, that created a problem until they brought in the Korean soldiers, and, uh, uh -huh. and then that slowed down dramatically. The rocks. The rocks. Yeah. Tiger Division. Ooh. Yeah, they were some yeah. pretty uh, pretty tough little guys. That's, yeah, I heard they were really good. So how long were you moving equipment then? I drew about 43 straight days of that. Wow. Yeah. It so was as soon as you get up to play coup, they put you in a plane, fly you back, and then you have to get in another truck. Right. Jeez. Next morning. It was an all-day trip to do 100 miles. <laughs> so <laughs> after 43 days, then you actually start doing maintenance, I guess, on helicopters? Uh, had, had the rest of the division? Our helicopters had shown up at that particular point, and uh -huh. then once we were back, then we had to put our sections together. And I was the chief, or not chief, but I was in charge of the hydraulics, so we started putting our van out and getting everything so that we could start you know, re doing some actual repair work at that right. particular point. I think we had two or four helicopters in just our unit, the, the maintenance unit itself. So we were working to build that, plus working to build some place to sleep. And so it was a it was a long day. It was a long 24-hour day. So, are you working on slicks and gunships, or just gunships? Uh, slicks and gunships, and uh, actually some of the OH-13s, the observation helicopters. Okay. So if, if it flew, we actually worked on it. Just for our audience, the slicks mainly moved troops, supported troops, uh, pulled troops out if they're wounded, dead, or just got them out of an area. Right, the uh, medevacs. They had two, two M60 machine guns, two door gunners, whereas the gunships had both the door gunners plus rockets and 
initially M60s that are command detonated and later miniguns, so. And yeah, and we carried 14 rockets too. Right. And you weren't carrying troops. Your, your no, job was to protect uh, the troops. And right. So you weren't really pulling anybody out or anything like that? No, we, uh, we couldn't, we were so l heavily laden with ammunition, we couldn't get off the ground with four of us yeah. in there, so uh, we had no room in the inn. <laughs> My, you told me that you know once you got mini guns, you understand that you're shooting 40 rounds a second, 2,400 rounds a minute. Yeah, per so gun. Per gun. So. Um, 4,800 rounds a minute. You got a lot of ammo on that thing. It must have been real heavy. It was very heavy. We uh, we weren't able to take off with much more than about a half a fuel load. Right. Because when we got everything loaded, it uh, it just at three thousand feet, it didn't want to get off the ground. It moaned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and you were saying you carried about three thousand rounds for the door gunners. Yeah, we each had three thousand to four thousand rounds yeah. in a door box for and our you one. Had triple that for the mini guns. So. Yeah, about eighteen thousand. I think it was somewhere around twenty-five thousand rounds of ammunition, and fourteen rockets with seventeen-pound warheads. So on you them. guys, you guys had some power there. We did. That yeah. was our job. So, at some point, you're going to be, instead of doing maintenance, you're going to become a door gunner. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a transformation. Uh, I actually, because as a kid I grew up, I was a hunter and I was kind of a mechanical kid, so I took, you know, always taking things apart and putting them back together. Yeah. Well, rifles and stuff were something that I did, so uh, I ended up being the door gunner on recovery missions for downed helicopters, uh -huh. uh, in, as well as the duties in, uh, uh, in the hydraulics department. And they would just come and get me and say, we gotta go, okay. And so we'd go out and then we'd retrieve helicopters that were shot, you know, had been shot down and bring them back, and then put them back together and send them back out. And then there was just a transition. Once they knew you could be a door gunner on recovery, then you could be a door gunner anytime. Yeah, they they kind of surmised that. that <laughs> <laughs> and so, I made the guns work. That yeah. was my job. So. And these M60s are just on bungee cords then? Yeah, we just had them on a, a bungee cord attached to the ceiling. And the thing that gets me, I ask every door gunner I meet, and you weren't tied in at all. You just got a mm -hmm. big old sliding door and you're hanging out that door. And there's nothing that keeps you from falling out except your own balance. Uh, that and wedging your feet into anything you <laughs> can to grab it on at certain times. Uh, but you know, yeah. and helicopter banks at times too, you know. Well, as long as it was positive Gs, it was great. If they were making a turn and throwing you into the floor, it was fine. It's when they did negative Gs that everything got all messed up because yeah. everything went to the ceiling and you were trying to hold everything down, plus stay inside the helicopter. That's, that's a good thing. Yeah, it yeah. was. <laughs> Never <laughs> wanted to fall out, that's for sure. So you were telling me about uh, one mission. We could talk about a whole bunch of them because you did a lot of missions, but one mission where you were heading across the border into either Cambodia or Laos, you weren't even sure because they probably didn't tell you and they'd have to kill you if they told you where they were going. <laughs> yeah, I just figured we were lost. But yeah. yeah. But we were following along. We were going in to, uh, to put some, uh, some long-range reconnaissance our LERPs uh, troops in. Uh -huh. And we went across the river and I saw the river and I thought, gee, that's the border, isn't it? But I thought maybe I had the wrong river. No. Apparently, didn't. apparently <laughs> I didn't, yeah. But we went and put them in, and uh, we pulled back, and we always hung out for a while to make sure they were safe and they were quiet and nobody was around them and they could get hidden real well. Well, we got a call, and uh, sure enough, we'd put them in the wrong spot right in the middle of a whole bunch of them. So we had to go back and we had to get them. Yeah, and now the slicks actually placed them. You guys were there for, to protect them. Yeah, we yeah. go in to make sure if the slick <laughs> draws any fire, we could suppress the fire so the slick could either get get them in, get them on the ground, or get them back in and get them up, back up in the air. I just wanted to make sure the audience understood. It wasn't your fault that they <laughs> went to the wrong LZ. That was the slick's job. You no, well actually the there we had a command ship. There were four ships, two gunships, uh, the, the slick that dropped them, and then a ship with the commander in it that actually ran the show. Oh. He's the one that kind of picked the wrong spot. One of those little helicopters. No, it was an actual, it was still a slick. Oh, okay. And uh, they, uh, it was a command ship and the, he coordinated everything. So. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so he kind of made a boo-boo that night. Yeah, I guess. So what happened? Well, we, when we went back out to get them, unfortunately, they were, they were being attacked at that point, and it was extremely close range. They were within 20 or 30 yards of each other, so we had to go in and uh, we had to suppress their, their fire so our guys could get up and retreat back in. Uh -huh. And we had found a place where we could get the slick in for them. So we just uh, we just held them in their position. We wouldn't allow them to move any at all. There was, they couldn't go anywhere. Could you use all your armament? Or? Well, we were limited at the first until we got them, a, you know, get them back about a hundred yards. We were limited to just our door guns because uh -huh. it was that close. We were, it was very uh, very very tedious putting ammunition in from a long distance at that. And eventually, as we could keep moving them back and they're not being able to move forward, then we were able to use more, more ordnance in order to keep them really right. suppressed. And, and we, did, uh, we did manage to get all four of them out and they didn't get hurt. Uh, uh, and it was, a, it was a pretty successful mission for us. It kind of started off wrong, but uh, the end product <coughs> was that we didn't get hurt. Right. And well, good, good job. Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> that, that was, uh, and you told me they thank you, and that's not yeah, something you've got very often. Mm -mm, no, they called us on, the, they got on a radio and uh, called us and thanked us for saving their bacon. Yeah. And we were very happy to do it. It there was our job. I, you know, I mentioned there was a lot of Special Forces guys that went across the border and never came back because exactly. they were ambushes and there was nothing they could do. So, so you did that. You were in country from, um, from when to when? You from August of '66 to what's I left September? September 15th of 1967. Uh, you're the first person who was able to tell me the day you got there and the <laughs> day you got out. So it uh, must have been memorable for you. The day day leaving, well, yeah, was our exit strategy for my friend and I, who uh, my crew chief, was uh, we were gonna ex we extended ourselves. We, uh -huh. were, we could have come home earlier, but we decided to stay so we could get a 90 day early out. Oh, okay. Well, we had planned it like 14 days after the 90 days, right? So, you know, we're taking chances. Yeah. Well, I was drafted December 15th, and I was discharged September 15th. That's actually 92 days. Ah. And I was sweating bullets when I was sitting in San Francisco because <laughs> I just knew they were going to send me back. and. Uh, the sergeant looked at me, because I, I raised my hand, and he said, anybody got more than 90 days? And I raised my hand, and he said, what's your ETS? And I told him, he says, we only have 30 days in the Army each month. And I went, oh boy, I can kiss you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I'm gonna drop back to, and, and uh, you were telling me also that, you know, a lot of these helicopters ended up looking like Swiss cheese, that you would sit on, what, your chest protectors? Yeah, actually, we, we just had a nylon jump seat. We had no armament in the helicopter itself for uh, the crew chief and the gunner. So we learned right away that, uh, that it was not a good thing to, to set on a piece of nylon and hope that everything coming through the bottom didn't get, get you hurt. So we had a, they had a flak thing that we were supposed to wear. Well, but eventually we took the back portion out of a 50 caliber ch chest projector, our back part. Okay. Just kept the chest part up because most stuff come from the front, uh -huh. and we sat on that and then put the flak vest over the top of it so it okay. could stop stuff from the ground up. But the pilot and the and the co-pilot had armament underneath them. Their seat was all armament. Was okay, would have would have stopped all small arms fire, but they had nothing in front and they had right. nothing for their legs. Right, so they still got hit. Oh yeah, they yeah. Were poor guys. Yeah. Um, so. You get back to where did you? They fly you back to Travis or? Where? Yeah, actually, w when we got, we flew in. We had been on a mission. My buddy and I, we come back in, and I don't know. We'd been out for three or four days, and we come back, and they said we were leaving the next morning, and that was nine o'clock at night. It was dark, so we we actually walked through the base camp with red flashlights, right? Remember those uh -huh, little critters? Sure. Yeah. And uh, we checked ourselves out, turned everything in. Next morning we got on a, on a truck, went to an air base, New Plaquu Air Force Base, and they flew us to Cameron Bay, where I originally started, right? right. And we flew from there uh, to Guam and from Guam to Travis. And okay. then we were out in about 48 hours, we were discharged. 
Did you get any kind of debriefing or anything? Did they give you <laughs> any assistance? They asked me if I wanted to re-up. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably pay paying well for those re-ing up. But, um, they were, but it uh, was a little too risky. So they got you, they kind of cleared you out of Travis, Travis pretty quickly, and that was well, it? Well, we went from Travis to Oakland Army Terminal. Oh, right. And then Same we were processed, took us to about 12, 14 hours, and they, they gave you a uniform, you know, they checked everything, asked you if you were all right, and of course nobody was going to say you weren't, right? Right. Oh, no, I'm not feeling well. Can I stay longer? But uh, they, uh, they checked everything, and they gave you your pay, and they opened up a door, and it closed and there you were standing going whoa yeah. moly it was a little frightening because you felt like you were painted orange yeah, yeah it was the it was a, a very quick exit it was probably in hindsight the worst thing that you could do because you did need time to slow down so you came back to sacramento yep and you said there was a while there you just didn't want to be around people you had a pretty oh, i couldn't time. go outside my house yeah. i couldn't get out the front door for how long? Uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't long because my, my stepfather was a Marine at uh, Iwo Jima in Saipan. Yeah. Uh, he uh, helped me out the door. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went back to work after about a week and a half. Uh-huh. And uh, wow, what a frightening experience. Doing the, sort of the journeyman stuff that you had been training. Well, uh, yeah, I was, and he had been my boss. Oh, so okay. <laughs> so I worked I for the it. family. Yeah. And uh, I went back and I, I, I started in, at, got me out of the house, got me going a little bit. and uh, Most of my friends were all gone at that point. You know, yeah. the high school buddies were all either in Vietnam or stationed someplace else. We were all gone at that point. Yeah. And then I finally ran into some friends and then I started stepping out of the house and doing a little better. But you talked about having nightmares, uh, not being able to sleep. Oh yeah. Uh, having survival, survivor's guilt, um, yeah, all those sort of things. You get a lot of you get a lot of things. It's funny you don't have them when you're first when you first come home, because yeah. you're still a soldier. But then after you've been home, of course the the inability to sleep was because I just never got to sleep for a year. Right. I think, and then when you did, you couldn't really go into deep patterns of sleep. It just uh, uh, it just wasn't something that you got to do very often. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then in the helicopters, you would think that we would have it really great fly back in at night, but we flew just as many missions at night in total darkness as we did during the day. Right. And uh, so you might get an hour's worth of sleep, and then hell would hit the you know hit the fan, and you'd be back out there, and you'd be on station all night until maybe three, four in the morning, and then you come back, you get an hour or two of sleep, sure. and then you got six o'clock takeoff again. So you just got in that, that pattern. And then after I'd been home for a while, then that stuff started coming back. You'd see it on TV and, and then it, it came back. So it's, it's been with me for the whole journey. Were you treated uh, in a negative manner at all by, by anyone or? Oh, sure. I mean, it was, that was probably the worst, the worst part of it is, is that when you got home, people would ask you, the damnedest questions. Like, uh, did you kill anybody? Yeah, that was always the big one, and you'd yeah. look at them and you go, wow, are you really that insensitive and don't get this? Right. But I guess it was more of fascination on their part. I, I don't, anybody who asked me that, I don't have any, harbor any ill feelings for, but then they would ask you political questions. Uh, ours wasn't political, ours was saving our butt. Right. And the guys around you, our job was, to, and to try, when I went, we were trying to win that thing and get everybody home and just start partying again, you know? Yeah. Uh, but it didn't, unfortunately, it didn't work out that way because we had kind of some bad tactical stuff. But yeah, you'd get asked things and then pretty soon you learn to never say anything. Right. Because once your hair got grown out a little bit, you didn't look like one of them guys. <laughs> and what was funny was when we all clammed up, and not decided not to talk about it. We couldn't even talk about it amongst ourselves. Wow. Because one of my very good friends from Sacramento here was, uh, uh, was in the same division I was, and he was in the infantry. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, we met uh, one or two times while, we were, while I was in Vietnam, and uh, he had just a horrible rough go of it. He, uh, he had a silver star, a bronze star for valor, 
three Purple Hearts and a Battlefield Commission. Wow. So what did he do for fun, you know? And it was funny, we never could talk about it until probably about 10 years ago. And you still see this guy now? Yeah, I see him every once in a while. I run okay. into him and his brothers, uh, some of the old car guys from oh, okay. way back when, and yeah. I do run into him. And, and he's been fighting the demons for a long time as well. Gosh. Were you able to use the GI Bill to? Actually, I did. Uh, I was able to do that. I looked at a lot of different careers after I got home. Uh, I. I enjoyed construction, but I decided I didn't want to do it my whole life. And then I, after I got home, I, for a little thrill, I started racing motorcycles. Uh, oh. 1969 was the year that I broke all of it, and oh. uh, that retired me. <laughs> 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 but, uh, and I did, I got injured early on, and that's how I ended up going to uh, a chiropractor. Oh, okay. So that was my introduction. I didn't know what they were beforehand. and. Uh, it was pretty fascinating. The guy helped me with a lot of health issues and uh, kind of changed my life in a way. And uh, so he kept saying, oh, you'd be a great chiropractor. And I told him he was crazy, right? And uh, eventually I, I kind of went uh, back to Iowa. I applied to the college and went back to Iowa. And uh, they had a quarter that was kind of like an introductory quarter, right? So you get an anatomy, physiology and stuff. But a lot of philosophy of why it was done and after about five or six weeks, I said, wow, I found out where I really belong. Uh -huh. And it was really a, an amazing thing. But then I wasn't sure, could, can you make it, right? Yeah. It's not an easy, not an easy four years. And, uh, but I stuck with it and I s did it and I graduated and now it's my 41st year of practice. Wow. Yeah, and I still love it every day. That's great, and your son is works with you, he's a chiropractor. Yes, my oldest son is a chiropractor. Yeah. And your younger son is an attorney. He's an attorney, yeah. So we've been a lucky family. Wow, that's nice. Well, Mike, I'd like to thank you for your service. Um, you're one of my heroes. Well, and thank you. I'm proud to know you and I think the world of you. That concludes our time on Valley to Vietnam. I'd like to thank uh, Mike for his service and say welcome home to him and all the vets. Uh, for Valley to Vietnam, producer Jerry Ward and director James Scott, I'm Bob Tribe saying so long for now and we'll join you next time.